right, well, this morning we're going to be back in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and I've titled today's message, The Benefits of Divine Discipline. Now, before I really get into our passage this morning, I, I know it's been a couple weeks since I was last up here. Um, if you were here last week, you know that Isaac taught and he did an outstanding, amazing job. Um, definitely blessed me as I heard the message. And I hope he blessed you as well. But now I'm back and we're going to pick up where we left off. But in case you weren't with us when I was last up here, I just want to back up just, just a bit and tell you a few things of what's been going on so far. Again, the last time we were together, we ended in verse 3 of chapter 12, where the author described Christ at the end of his race, how he endured the cross for us, not because he was looking for riches or fame or because he wanted some kind of earthly prize. Instead, he saw that he despised the shame refusing to see it as shame and wore the crown of thorns the crown of thorns for our good and his father's glory he wrote this so as we run our own race we can see Christ as a model that we can constantly look to for inspiration and for encouragement See, the only way to run with endurance in the race that lies before us is to stand firm. To stand firm and consider the only one who endured a far greater hostility. Those who look away from Christ, the end goal of our race will never finish well which seems to have been happening to many in the early church who were tired of just running this race and just wanted to give up. They had begun to take their eyes off Christ and fix them instead on the hardships that were challenging them. Like many of us today, when these Hebrew Christians first came to Christ, the Savior filled every aspect of their lives. It was a delightful, joyous fixation. But that initial rush of joy began to be assaulted by hardships. Some of their lifelong friendships started to cool off, and those friends started to back away. They were no longer welcomed in their local synagogues. Some of them lost their jobs as they, as they were squeezed out of the family business. Others were assaulted by domestic stress as even husbands, husband and wife relationship started to become strained over the matter of Christ. And to add to all of that, their newfound faith didn't shield them from the common challenges of life. The little things, the, I mean, not the little things, but just the things that are common in our lives. They suffered losses, accidents, illnesses, and death just like everyone else. And as a result, they became distracted. Those increasingly longer looks away from Christ just left them off stride. It took them off balance. Others stumbled here and there. And tragically, a few had just quit altogether. But if you think about it, if you really think about it, they were, in a sense, just a smaller version of many in the church today who have also lost their focus through hardship. 
those who have said at one time or another, wow, it began so good, it began so well, but I didn't expect this. I had problems before I became a Christian, but nothing, nothing at all like this. Thanks for the offer of of a great life, an abundant life, uh, a joyous life, a fellowship. But now I've got an abundance of problems. You go ahead. I think I'll take a break from this Christian life. I think I'll take a break from Jesus. Well, in the passage we're going to be looking at today, the author will encourage people like these. He will do this with another analogy. The last analogy he used was a race. Well, here now, he will use the analogy of the discipline of a parent. Using an Old Testament passage, he will make the case as to why believers should embrace the hardships as an expression of God's love and acceptance. And as you will see, the point he will make is that as believers, we need to look to our ultimate source for finding strength, Jesus Christ, in order to obtain a proper understanding of the Heavenly Father's discipline. So this is, again, why I titled to message the benefit of divine discipline because hopefully by the time we are done today you'll be able to see the benefit of God's discipline and so before we get into our first part of our passage this morning let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this morning's time that we have with him Um, Lord we are thankful Lord we are thankful that you brought us here doesn't matter if it's two, three, four, five, or a hundred, or a thousand, Lord, you've, there's a reason and purpose why everyone's here, Lord, and, and we know that you're gonna, that you want to speak to every single person that's here, every person that is watching this message, or listening to it live, or maybe listening to it later on, we know that there's a divine purpose, a reason, Lord, for that, and, and, and especially for those who are maybe going through some kind of discipline right now, Lord, who are going through some hardship and are having a hard time understanding the reasons why. So I hope and I pray, Lord, that you will speak to them powerfully now through this message. They will remove all the distractions, Lord, and that they will just focus on what you have to tell them. So watch over this place now, Lord. Protect us. Fill this room with your spirit, Lord. And may we just sit at your feet now and hear your word. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 12. I know, although it says there in, we're going to be beginning in verse 4, I just want to back up one verse, I'm going to be beginning in verse 3, um, but yeah, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, and the Word of God says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the, Lord's discipli- for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Endure sufferings as as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. The author here begins this section 
with just a, a pair of gentle reproaches. First, he reminds them in verse 4 that life isn't really as bad as they may think it is, that it is. He says, uh, in, in struggling against sin, he says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Jesus, of course, had suffered death because of his decision to stay on track all the way to the cross. And some of the heroes of the faith so memorably praised at the end of chapter 11 had paid the ultimate price as well. But even though that Hebrew church had experienced severe persecution under Emperor Claudius, no one had been martyred yet. And so that being the case, they really shouldn't be discouraged, especially considering the examples he mentioned in chapter 11, who hadn't buckled under greater hardships. Stop the drama, the writer seems to be saying. I don't see any bodies laying on the ground yet. Now, the not yet there in verse 4 is critical for us reading this today. Why is that? Because even though some of them, some of us have never experienced physical persecution, it remains a real possibility for all of us. We must always remember that the comfort the comfort we know we we now we know now is not guaranteed to last forever things can change quickly many of us have seen on news reports how many parts of the world how in many parts of the world in an instant countries change regimes constitutions or law enforcement approaches. So you see, persecution, persecution of Christians can happen anywhere and at any time, and can quickly lead, yes, to the shedding of blood. We are blessed because that's not the case here right now. Why is that? Because we have a strong constitutional, we have strong constitutional protections. But again, all that can change in an instant. That being the case, let me echo again what the writer is basically saying. Stop with the drama. There haven't been any bodies, there aren't any bodies laying around. Now also understand this, the struggle isn't just against persecution. It's also a struggle against sin. In other words, the author is also saying in verse 4 that, is that he, what he's saying is that resisting temptation, the temptation to fall away can also be described in terms of resisting the temptation to fall to sin. The temptation to avoid persecution or to abandon the faith is ultimately the temptation to submit to sin. The writer here, the, uh, the writer's other approach or reproach was this. They had failed to recall and reassure themselves of God's word. You can see it there. He tells them in the beginning of verse 5, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. This, of course, is an even more common sin in the modern church because of what researchers and pollsters have found. They've noted that there's a large percentage of Christians, a large percentage who those who claim to be believers who cannot name the books of the Bible, 
or locate the Ten Commandments or the Beatitudes. Do you know where they're at in the Bible? Just those simple things, the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes. Can you name all the books of the Bible? This fact brings us to an undisputable saying. We cannot be profoundly influenced or encouraged by that which we do not know. See, church, the comfort and strength of God's word, it won't do us any good. It won't do you any good if you don't know it. Knowing the Bible, brothers and sisters, is essential for spiritual survival. This is what the writer was insisting on back in chapter 2, verse 1, when he said, We must pay attention all the more to what we've heard, so that we will not drift away. Do you know what the Word of God says? Is, he spe- is the writer speaking to you when, again, he says in the beginning of verse 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you, as sons, and you can also add their daughters. Well, after having reproached his congregation for forgetting God's word, the author calls for their attention in a special word of encouragement. Addressing them specifically as sons, as God's children, he quotes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. To warn those undergoing hard times of two opposite pitfalls. Disdain and dismay regarding divine discipline. Regarding the perils of disdain, he says in the middle of verse 5, My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly. Fact is, many who experience unpleasantness of discipline, the unpleasantness of discipline, choose to remain indifferent to its significance. They don't notice that they're experiencing discipline. And if they do, they just refuse to meditate on what it might mean. They make light of it. They blow it off. Why? Because it's better to ignore one's hardships and to see it and then do something about it. But here's the thing, folks. When we refuse to consider our own deep waters, our lives remain perpetually shallow. The other pitfall is Dismay. He says in verse 5 again, or lose heart when you are reproved by him. Far from being indifferent to discipline, there are some who are overwhelmed by it all. They're paralyzed. Just as, runner, just as the runners described in verse 3 came to grow weary and give up and collapse on the track. Such giving up is inexcusable because none of God's children will ever be tested beyond their strength. So Paul mentioned this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able But with the the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. So we see that when disciplined, we must not afford ourselves either the luxury of disdain or dismay. Why? Because discipline is a telltale sign of being loved by God and in a family relationship to him. As verse 6 says, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son 
he receives. In other words, and, and I know he's mentioning son here, but if you're a woman, if you're a female, you can apply it to yourself as well as, you know, in, the res in respect to uh, his daughter. But what he's saying here, if we cop out in respect to the door, in, in respect to the Lord's discipline, either by disdain, making light of it, or dismay by fainting away, we're turning our back on the personal evidence of his love and relationship to us. So see, the point, my friends, is that discipline is divinely ordained, is a divinely ordained path to a deepening relationship with God and a growing love with him. Let me repeat that. Discipline is the divinely ordained path to a deepening relationship with God and a growing love with Him. In fact, it's the only path. And when we refuse discipline, we're turning our back on growth and love. Now, when it comes to administering discipline, this is a parent's job. If you're a parent, that's your job and no one else's job. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't stand here or I wouldn't discipline your own child. I wouldn't do that. And I wouldn't allow you to discipline my own kids. And, see, and so why wouldn't I do that? Because even though, again, I may love your kid, even though I may just really sincerely love your child and really want what's best for him or her, it'll never be the same as the love that I have for my own children. The Lord brought them into my life, and that's the job he gave me and my wife to discipline them, to raise them up. Now, yes, we have people around us that will encourage us, that will help us and, and maybe give us advice and all that. But ultimately, we're going to be held accountable to God for how we raised our children, for how we disciplined them. Now, you know, some will say that you know, we need to discipline our children our, a lot, not just our children, but children in general a lot more but one thing I've noticed is regardless of how you discipline them they're still going to grow up to be people they're, they're going to have their own minds their own hearts they're going to have you know they're going to make their own decisions you can't as parents you can't control them forever you can only hope and pray that again that you did well that you raised them well that you disciplined them well and that you they know better when it comes to maybe a hard decision that may come their way that they will choose the right thing but again it's your job it's your job to discipline your own child and so when Solomon wrote to his son in Proverbs chapter 3, whom he disciplined, he pretty much was telling him, you should take the Lord's discipline as a sign of how much he loves you in the same way that I discipline you because I love you. A lot of good parents out there, and I'll be talking about bad parents in a bit, but when you discipline your child, you don't do it out of hate. You do it out of love. You know they're not going to like it, you know, but you know that you're doing it out of love. And so what you ought to remind them as they get older, that when God disciplines them, it's because he, he's, doing it, he's doing it because he loves them. Not to take it personal, not to take it as, 
You know, he, God knows what he's doing. And it's for their own good. So as he moves on to verse 7, he now basically begins elaborating more on that proverb that he just quoted. Proverbs chapter 3. The first, oh, well, yeah, the first part of verse 11 elicits a command. Endure suffering as discipline. See, if Jesus endured, it's imperative. It's imperative that we, as believers, endure. The word discipline comes from the root word generally meaning to teach or instruct as one would a child. Often it means to correct or punish, as it means here. Broadly, it signifies much more, much of what we would think of as discipline on the purpose, for the purpose of education. Now, we experience God's education through hardship or affliction, through suffering. Significantly, God's, dis dis God's discipline of His children never involves His wrath. Every reference in the New Testament on the subject indicates that God's wrath rests upon and is, re is reserved for the unbelieving. God has no such thoughts toward his own. No thoughts of calamity. One Old Testament scholar made a really good perceptive comment regarding this. He said, his plans concerning his people are always thoughts of good, a blessing. Even if he is obliged to use the rod, it is not the rod, it is it is the rod not of wrath, but the Father's rod of chastisement for their temporal and eternal welfare. There is not a single item of evil in His plans for His people, neither in their motive, nor in their conception, nor in their revelation, nor in their consummation. End quote. Some of you, here, I don't know, but maybe some of you also watching and listening. Man, you probably had some really awful, terrible parents. A terrible dad, again, specifically here, who maybe abandoned you, who maybe abused you, who maybe neglected you. And for that, my heart breaks. I truly am sorry that you had to go through that no one no one should ever have to experience that from their father it's horrible i know if that's you if you've had a bad parent let me tell you this you mustn't i don't want you to make the assumption that your heavenly Father, that God the Father, is exactly like them. He's not. Your heavenly Father isn't like that terrible father, like that terrible parent you had. He's way better. He's way better. He will never leave you. He won't abandon you. He won't abuse you. He won't neglect you. He will always be there to take care of you. And when you breathe your last, He will be there to embrace you. Again, many people make the mistake of thinking that God in heaven is some mean, malevolent, awful person. And, you know, you sometimes think, as believers, we, I sometimes, as a believer, I sometimes think, is that how your dad was to you? Because if that's how your dad was, I'm, I'm sorry. 
God's not like that. He wants to teach you. He wants to instruct you. But He also, as a loving Father, like any loving Father, He wants you to obey Him. He wants you to listen to Him. He wants you to just follow Him. And so the writer to the Hebrews, who exhorts his readers that dis- basically he exhorts his readers that discipline is a means to an end. The goal being this: developing a stronger bond with God that's based on the knowledge that He truly has your best interest in mind. So from here, we see that God's discipline takes three distinct forms. And if, again, you're taking notes, these are the three distinct forms, and I'll go over some of these. Over these I'll go over these three forms, but those three are corrective discipline, preventative discipline, and educational discipline. Yes, there are probably others, but I'll only mention the ones that are discussed here in our passage. The first one, corrective discipline. Sometime, sometimes God's children undergo, undergo corrective judgment that comes directly from God's love. Not God's anger, not God's hatred, but God's love. King David is a prime example. He's a prime exhibit here. His adultery and resulting homicide brought down stiff judgment. The son of his affair died, and later violence came to his home. His son Ammon raped his half-sister Tamar. Absalom murdered Ammon. And then, in league with Bathsheba's father, Ahithophel, staged Rebellion, stage of rebellion. This was a stiff correct. This was a stiff corrective, but David did learn from it, and grew in grace. Consider Psalm fifty-one, and also the chastened wisdom of Psalm one nineteen. There, in Psalm one nineteen, verses sixty-seven. Through 71. I won't read them all, but he pretty much says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. It was good for me to be afflicted so that, so that I'm, I might learn your decrees. Likewise, in the New Testament, the Corinthian church underwent God's corrective discipline when some of its believers suffered illness and even death because they were profaning the Lord's Supper through their greedy, self-centered indulgence, and in some, case, in, in some cases, outright drunkenness. Paul explained, when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the, Lord, with the world. Harsh correctives, yes, but they come from a heart of fatherly love. A second form of discipline is preventative discipline. Now, it's a fact. It's the fact of forestry that often when, a, when small trees are cleared away, some of, the big, some of the big trees will subsequently come down. Why? The smaller trees shielded the larger trees from nature's assaults, and thus the large trees never developed the strength to stand alone. Just so, God regularly allows His children to undergo hardships to prevent their falling. For example, the Apostle Paul was a humbled man. Nevertheless, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, he tells us that God gave him a thorn in his flesh to keep him from becoming conceited. 
because of the great revelation that God had given him. He had prayed. Paul had prayed for them to be removed, for that thorn to be removed. But later, thank God, as he realized how his thorn had protected him. That same, this same realization enabled a well-known pastor to pray this. Thou divine love, whose human path has been perfected by sufferings, teach me the value of any thorn. And then shall I know that my tears have been made a rainbow. And I shall be able to say, it was good for me that I have been afflicted. So you see, my friends, preventative discipline, properly understood, is seen as substantial grace. And the third form of discipline is educational discipline. A careful reading of the story of Job reveals that his afflictions came not as coercive or corrective discipline or preventative discipline, but for his education. This is magic, uh, majestically confirmed by, Job, by Job's own words at the end of his ordeal in Job chapter 42, verses 4 through 6, where he says, Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask thee, and you instruct me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees thee. Therefore, I retract and repent in dust and ashes. And that's from the NASB. Job's afflictions, coupled with his dialogue with God, gave him a stupendous revelation of God far beyond that of his contemporaries. And so from Job's example, we understand that discipline may not come because one is doing poorly, but because one is doing well. Job was, in fact, a spiritual athlete. And because of his excellence, God, like a wise coach, brought greater stress and challenge to Job so that he might ascend to undreamed levels of spirituality. So again, all the hardships that come the believer's way, that may come your way, are loving discipline and are, in fact, either corrective, preventative, or educational. I want you to remember that. Brothers and sisters in Christ, to endure rightly, one must endure intelligently. See, if we have an informed, intelligent, biblical understanding of the afflictions that come our way, and we believe God's word, we will endure. The correction of David, the prevention of Paul, and the education of Job, this is sanctifying grist for the reflective heart, said one person. Now, there's another thing I want you to also keep in mind. Discipline shouldn't be regarded as the only reason God allows difficult times, but it is an important one. For example, we know that God allows difficult times so that we can, at a later time, comfort those or comfort others with the same comfort that God shows towards us in our crisis. This is why James recommends a prayer for wisdom in the context of enduring trials in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 5. It's important then, my friends, for us to know how to react differently when God does different things. We can't react the same way. We gotta, re we gotta learn how to react. We gotta know how to react differently. All right, 
Let me read the rest of the, our passage here this morning now. I'm going to read chapter or verse 7 again and then go all the way to 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not, for what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us, and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them. But he does this for our benefit, so that none can share, so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here again, the author continues its discussion and reveals the purpose. He, here he reveals the purpose of discipline. He says it right there in the middle of verse 11. To bring the fruit of righteousness. This fruit must, it must be evident in the life of the Christian. The reason many experience one crisis after another in life is because they, either, they are either blind to God's chastening or they resist it. They're not trained by it and therefore the peaceable fruit of righteousness isn't evident. Christian, brother and sister in Christ, God has a purpose for training you. Think of David after a, after a lion attacked when he was just a boy tending the sheep. He could easily have despaired. He could easily have freaked out and asked, why God? Why did God allow such a terrible thing to happen to me? I barely escaped. But David could see ahead. He could see God had a giant named Goliath. He was destined to face. And the, ba and the battle with the lion prepared him ahead of time. Do you get it? Do you understand? God always has a purpose. You can trust him. You can trust God. We know that because the parent loves the child, he always disciplines in a reasonable, firm, authoritative, and yet loving and righteous way. A father shows his son he loves him through discipline, through his discipline. If he didn't love him or her, he would let, he would just let them run wild. But he wants his son, he wants his daughter to know the peaceful fruit of righteousness. To show him or her this, the father's love must sometimes take the form of discipline. Now, a lot of people tend to think that a lot of things happen by chance. However, the truth is that things come into our lives by the sovereign intentions and purposes of the Lord. Not all things are good, but all things are for the good and edification of those who love God. Sometimes Christians have to keep faith when things don't seem to be for our favor or for our good. In Romans 8, Paul describes that God is working in all things for the good of believers. This doesn't mean that we need to be thankful for the development of tumors or other tragic things that happen. 
These aren't things that we would ask for or even pray for. Yet even in difficult situations, God is working for your good. It's this truth that the author has in mind when he writes this passage in Hebrews. God is working through your, for your good. God, as a loving father, may be disciplining us, sharpening and maturing our faith. And when people think of discipline, when a lot of people think of discipline, they only often think of corrective discipline or of punishment. But discipline is far more than that. It's teaching. Yes, it's true that discipline, by its nature, it's painful and it sucks, but it has a purpose. It has a purpose, brothers and sisters. We have a God who knows what he's doing. As his child, you may not always know why you're being disciplined or how the discipline is an act of love, but it isn't necessary that you understand these things at every point, at every single moment. You see, if you understood all of this in advance, you wouldn't have done whatever it was that required discipline. So do you get it? Certain lessons can only be learned by discipline. You see, my friends, God is making disciples through discipline. Now, yes, I myself also know from experience, from experience how tempting it is to complain about discipline and to think it's a sign that God doesn't love you. We question how God can work for good through horrifying loss. Yet God was working for our good in the gruesome death of his son. If you ever doubt God's love because of your circumstances, now listen carefully again. You can look to the cross and remind yourself that God gave you his own son so that you might in turn become a child of God. He used that horrifying, terrible moment in order to make you a child of God. So let me now wrap up this message by saying this about what we just read. The point of this passage isn't to look to our earthly fathers, but to look to Jesus, our ultimate source for finding strength and obtaining a proper understanding of the Heavenly Father's discipline. As Christians, we must look to Christ because he endured suffering for the church's salvation. The hostility that he bore was the greatest, was the hostility all of us deserved. None of the Old Testament figures suffered or acted for the elect in the way that Christ did by substituting himself. So again, it all comes back to Jesus. It all points to Jesus. He is therefore the key focus here. He is, this is what the writer wants you to focus on. He wants you to focus on Jesus. So now as I close this message, some of you probably have never seen 
it this way. Some of you have never considered Jesus as the key focus. Now I want to give you that opportunity to make him the focus of your life. I will pray with you, lead you in a prayer to do that, but quickly I want to maybe talk to those who are going through some form of discipline, some form of chastising. You're going through a really difficult time. I encourage you, I urge you actually, to come before the Lord and ask Him. Come to Him. If you need to, just sprawl out, face down to the Lord and ask Him, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Come to Him with, hum, with a humble heart. You know what? He may not answer you right then and there, but the more you pray that, the more you do that, the more He will reveal His will and purpose for that discipline. And why? Because you're His child. And He loves you. Every time I've had to discipline any of my kids, I never left it at that. I always came back to them and explained why I had to discipline them so that they understand, so that they will learn. Come to the Lord, and He will eventually reveal to you the reason for your discipline. Maybe you're angry, maybe you're upset. You know what? Forget all that. Ask Jesus to forgive you for your stubborn heart, for ignoring, for being indifferent towards his discipline. If you know what it is, do something about it. Change that behavior. Change those things, those he's trying to tell you to stay away from. If you've lost all your money because you've been gambling, or you're spending it on drugs and alcohol, whatever it may be, and now you broke, now you're living in the street, he's disciplining you. He's telling you, you need to cut this out because it's destroying you. It's destroying our relationship. Acknowledge it. Change it. Do something about it. Ask the Lord to give you the strength. So come before Him. Come before the Lord. Now again, back to those who want to come to God and ask for forgiveness. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes, and pray this. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and then rose from the dead three days later. And now repent of my sins. I turn from them and confess you and only you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I humbly ask you to fill me. Fill my entire life my heart, my mind, with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me and instruct me and teach me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, welcome to the fam family of God. I want you to, if you're able to, get a hold of us. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your story. 
I want to hear how this message blessed you. But also, if you believe this message will bless others, please don't hesitate to share it. There's, I'm not going to come after you for copyright infringement or any of that. You can copy it, paste it, send it out far and wide. You know, this is the gospel message. And people need to know. The world needs to know what Jesus did for them, but also that they have a father, loving Father in heaven who wants to have a relationship with them. So, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. So for now, goodbye. We love you. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.